All right, welcome to the Jazz Piano School podcast, episode number 51. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Brendan Lowe, and it's a pleasure to be here doing this podcast for you guys. Now, this podcast is going to be on tips and my advice on how to improvise at faster tempos. And I had someone email in, and she discovered the podcast, and asked me this question and I said, you know what, we haven't done a podcast on this. I haven't done a podcast on this yet, so I would love to answer your question in a podcast. And again, guys, if you you have any questions or things that I haven't gone over in the podcast, just shoot me an email, brendanlow at jazzpianoschool.com. I'm always more than willing to help you out, answer the question, and again, like this specific question on how to increase your improv at faster tempos, it's going to benefit a lot of people and I haven't done it before so I thought it was a great topic so thank you all for being here Uh, again this is the Jazz Piano School podcast we are um, related to the website jazzpianoschool.com which I have founded and my purpose for Jazz Piano School is to become the number one jazz piano educator around the world and kind of the the slogan or saying I've been telling people now is I want to be the Rosetta Stone of Jazz Piano (laughs) So just helping as many people around the world who are interested jazz piano enthusiasts get better because it's a hard music to learn and through my career of teaching and playing and performing, I've realized in my own difficult journey that it's not that easy to learn jazz piano and it's hard to find good structured organized material that's going to lead you down a path to improve. And a lot of the times my students, and even I've gone through this myself, is that we're zigzagging back and forth. We don't have confidence. We're unsure if we're doing the right thing. We never know what to practice. Our lessons are inconsistent. And it's a, it's a wish wash, right? It's all over the place. It can lead to very, you know, a lot of frustration, doubt, and a lot of people actually just give up or quit. And I hate to see that because it's such a beautiful music. And the more music we can spread to others, uh, you know, the better the world is going to be. So (laughs) if you guys enjoyed the podcast, I'd love for you to go ahead and rate the podcast or give it a five-star review. Again, my goal is to get to 100 five-star ratings before I get to 100 podcasts. And I've seen some people uh, give some ratings. So if you're listening to this, thank you very much. I really, really appreciate it. It has gone up. We're at 30, I believe now. Uh, So we do need a lot more and I really, really appreciate it. It takes about two seconds to do and uh, you're helping out tremendously to spread JPS to other players as well. So again, this is a podcast. If you're listening, I do like to kind of talk and uh, just babble a little bit on this uh, rather than my educational videos because um, I I tend to be more focused in those. But since this is more of a podcast, podcasts are are audio, right, for talking. But if you are interested in the video, go ahead and skip through the talk, you know, just get to the portion you want. But I just wanted to let you guys know, I don't always do this and it's funny because you know, I have people email me on a consistent basis, you know, Brendan, oh my God, is this all you do? It's like, you never stop working. You never stop, you know, producing content or, you know, giving education. And I, you know, I do work a lot because I love it. I love what I do. I love expanding and improving jazz piano school, trying to make it the best possible. And I just have a internal drive and, you know, inner motivation to get better constantly and I I don't know where it comes from but I just enjoy it you know I finally found what I love and I enjoy it a lot so but it was my friend's birthday yesterday and we did something very fun Uh, we went to an escape room and call me a nerd but this was very very fun and I'm definitely going to be partaking in more different themed escape rooms so some of this some of you guys might be like oh my god I can't do this like if you get claustrophobic Uh, It's definitely not for you, but basically you're put in a room and you're kind of locked in there. Sorry, I'm getting the sniffles right now. (laughs) You're kind of locked in there, uh, but not really. Obviously, you can get out, but your goal is to escape the room through puzzles, you know, in under an hour. So at the hour, if you haven't gotten out with uh, what we, our theme was kind of Indiana Jones. So we had that little head, gold statued head, you know, uh, Indiana has to get in the beginning of uh, Temple of Doom, I believe. Um, we had to get that out of the room in under an hour and you win. But it was just loads of fun. So I do do other things besides jazz piano. I actually play ice hockey too because I'm being from Boston. Love hockey. 
do a lot of different things besides piano, but that was awesome. I highly recommend that. If you guys have that in the area or in your area, look up escape rooms in whatever city you're in. It's so fun. I mean, it's all ages, right? We had a, a group of family uh, family members who were with us, you know, uh, some mothers, some fathers, children, you know, and so it, you, got, you all work together to try and get out of the room and solve these puzzles. Great time. So again, thank you for being here. Another thing I want to let you guys know is that if you're listening to this podcast in real time, right, as we've just released it, uh, this will be a new update if you're kind of listening to it uh, later in the future. Um, you can go on the website and see this, but uh, one of my colleagues slash friends has written a blog post that we are producing, um, and the jazz pianist who I'm referring to is uh, Joe Gilman, and he is a phenomenal, phenomenal pianist. Uh, played with Bobby Hutchinson for a very long time, kind of cut his teeth and you know learned a lot of different things as he was growing um, from him and playing in that group and just you know an absolute monster you know at the piano has many recorded albums as a leader has been on a lot of different recordings and uh, you can find his music all over but he uh, is primarily based out of Sacramento so I'm lucky to have gotten to know him a little bit and uh, you know, talk to him and obviously we share, he, he does a lot of educating and things like that. So he's been kind enough to write a blog post for the site, which we will be releasing. So I'm super excited about that. You guys are going to learn a lot from it. I guarantee it. I know it. And that kind of educational collaboration is really where I'm looking to take jazz piano school in the future. Um, besides my own education, because I really do want to get a lot of different people on here and you know, it's not just about me. So many other jazz pianists have so much to offer, you know, that can relate to the education that I'm giving as well. So I want you guys to all be able to experience that. Not everyone gets to go to New York, you know, to go to school for jazz piano or, you know, learn from, you know, great, high, well-known teachers. I mean, a lot of us are kind of just doing it on our own or you know, have a teacher in the city we're in, but I really want to expose everyone to all this great information from these great pianists that I can to help you guys out. So that's really something I'm really, really excited about. Um, be on the lookout for that. We'll be releasing that soon. So let's uh, get into the lesson. Again, the practice materials for every episode, sometimes I'll forget to say it, I think I forgot last week, but we'll be at, if we do have them, They'll be at jazzpianoschool.com forward slash podcast and then the number of the podcast. So since this is 51, your practice materials, or sometimes they're not actually written out practice materials, will be more of a guide or an outline sheet to the points I've talked about. And I think there may be some in this. I usually construct them after because I get into a workflow of talking and then sometimes I want to add some more things in afterwards but they'll be at jazzpianoschool.com forward slash podcast 51 and again if you are enjoying the podcast the podcast is more kind of jump around library ish style which I you know is my kind of it's my I don't know what do you call it my pet peeve I, I don't like to teach like this jazz piano school the main course with the members community that you can join is a structured and organized system that you follow step by step that expands and leads you down in the correct order uh, by myself so that you're learning jazz piano in a cumulative way, right? It's more of a curriculum, it's not a library. I want to do something different with jazz piano school and that was provide a step by step course rather than a lot of the libraries that you see or the jumping around of the different resources that are available to you online. So again, jazzpianoschool.com forward slash podcast. 51 and let's get right to it. So how do we improve our improv at faster temples? Well, there's a lot of different things that go into that. Now, I'm going to say point number one I'm going to make. I have seven points here uh, or tips for you guys to know and understand and work on. My first tip is obviously going to be technique. Okay. Now, it's not the technique, if you guys have ever been on any of my trainings before, okay, it's not the technique where I just want you to practice, you know, handing. You know, stuff like that, or, you know, all these kind of exercises, I, you know, I'm trying to recall some of the other ones that, um, that I've done. Um, let me see. Uh, you know, any sort of, now these exercises are great and 
I definitely re I do recommend playing them, but as we as I go through the other points in here, they're not going to be the main focus. Now, technically, if your hands can literally not do something on the piano, that's going to inhibit you from playing what you want, right? And obviously, scales and all those things are great for mastering your cro crossovers, cross excuse me, cross unders, and we need those things to be able to play fast. Now, when you first start out playing piano, playing scales or a C major scale is going to be difficult, but through our muscle memory, it slowly becomes easy, and that's what we want our train to train our hand to do. But in jazz, when improvising, there's a difference between training our hand technically and training our hand spontaneously. Right? And that's where the disconnect comes from with a lot of people. They'll, they'll play their chair in the exercises, they'll play their hand in exercises, and then go to improv and say, well, why, aren't I, why can't I play faster? Why, you know? It's because just practicing written exercises like that isn't the act of improving your hand muscle memory for the lines and movements that you want to play. And again, in my jazz piano education, technique, the exercises that I recommend you do, focus on a theory tool. They're not random technique exercises where a lot of people, again, uh, go to when trying to improve technique. Oh, I want to improve my technique? Okay, I'll play scales, you know, for days, right? And I'll just do that, you know, and hopefully my technique will get better. Well, yes, it will get better, right? And that's what we want. But again, there's more variations to that. So if there's certain things you can't do uh, with your hand, like cross under, we need that, or cross over, right? Cross over. Technically, that needs to happen. Now, uh, you can get that from classical exercises, you know, or... Right, something like that. Now in my solo, I could go for that because my hand can do it. Now that was kind of sloppy obviously because that's a very difficult, technically difficult classical move to do when you have those uh, the thirds uh, synchronized with the one. And switching, right? Now, obviously, you, if you want to be able to play that in your solo, you need to practice that. Uh, but again, you need to strengthen your hand and your muscle memory for what's coming up. So what do I recommend here? How, how do we make this applicable, right? How do we put this into action? Well, work on your technique exercises. If you do not have the basic technique down, that needs to be done. So hand and chair knee and all these classical exercises are great for that. But if you're at the point where you can play your scales, right, and we'll get into this later, your crossover is fine. You don't need that technique anymore, I wouldn't say. It's not the, um, it's not what's holding you back, okay? So that's why my first point is technique, all right? So if you're at the level where you can play scales, just with the ease that I just did, up and down, you know, you're fine. You don't need more classical training, okay? That's not what's holding you back. And again, you should be able to do that with other scales. And it should be just as easy, okay? And, and we're not talking about left-hand technique right now, just right-hand improvisation. But if you're not at that point to be able to play something with the ease that I just did, right, you really want to get that more of a classical or technical foundation under your fingers so that the flow and movement of your hand comes with those crossovers because that's really what's important. Now, going on to step number two, okay? We need to work with what we have so in order to play fast, right? And this is a fine line between what we know and what we don't know, right? And I'm going to get into this again a little bit later. But we need to work with what we have. Now, there's a, again, there's a difference, right? In my jazz education system at, at jazz piano school, there's categories. So just by focusing on your improv, you're not going to you're not going to you're going to grow but not at an optimal rate and that's what i see through most people working on their own or trying or jumping around to different resources now what i mean by that is 
if you're practicing your improv, you're not learning actual jazz tools. You're really kind of just working on one thing, and I don't even really know what that is, and most people don't even know how to practice improv. They'll just keep trying and practicing bad things over and over and over again, and thus they don't get better, because they don't really know how to practice improv. Or they'll practice licks and transcriptions, which is basically just copying, right? Which does improve your language and vocabulary, but as far as the ultimate freedom of expression that you want to get to, or the level you want to get to where you're not just playing other people's ideas, that's not going to do it for you either, unfortunately. All right, so work with what you have at first. Now, if you know how to solo, and you only know how to solo, depending upon what level you're at, just with a, just with a scale, then that's what you want to practice. Okay, Just practice using the notes of the scale to solo with. So if I'm in the key of C, right, and I know my C major scale, now again, theoretically, the only way I know how to solo is with a, a scale, my C major scale, then just solo with a C major scale. Don't try and do more than you know. right? And, and this is where you can see the direct correlation of theory to technique to repertoire to improv. There's many different categories, and those four categories are what I teach out of in a systematic order okay, at Jazz Piano School. But to know a theory concept and then work on technique is two different things. So the more theory you know or the more concepts you know, then you can turn those into exercises that build your uh, improv uh, understanding, and then we can create improv exercises out of those and apply them to tunes. Okay, but anyway, here's my C major scale. Right, it doesn't need to be much. If I'm playing a two, five, one, one, two, one, two, three, four. That's it. Now I'm just using the notes from the C major scale, but I'm improvising with them. Okay? So don't go, you know, don't try and do more than your hand can't do. And again, technically, you have to follow your hand pattern. If my hand's not used to doing a crossover or an arpeggio, and let's say I want to be able to go something like that in my solo, then I need to work on that movement technically in my hand. Right? To be able to do that. So again, the more you know, then the more you can start to use, okay? But don't go out of your comfort zone. Now, again, if you're learning some of your approach notes, or let's say you listened to the podcast recently I just did on Bebop, you can start to use the, the half step below, right? Chord scale above, or the combination. <laughs> right, in your solo. Okay, so if you know those concepts, then use them. But again, stick with my main point on number two is to stick within your means, right? Don't try and go outside your means and work with what you have and then grow that slowly based on your theoretical concepts you're studying on the side. But it should all be done cohesively. That's why, you know, <laughs> a lot of times there's no plan, so you're kind of do, trying to do everything at once where these items should be isolated and then connected. But again, number two, stay within your means. And again, if you only have three notes, I can create a soul out of three notes, right? One, two, one, two, three, four. one note in the end there. That's a fast tempo and I use three notes for my solo. All right? So, you don't need you don't need to do much, right? Now, point number 3. Feel the time slower. Now, it's funny. In the middle, right? At faster tempos, to make it easier, you want to feel that you want to subdivide your time internally and feel it as a slower tempo. At slower tempos, you can do the same thing to create contrast. Uh, when playing ballads is subdivide the time faster so you feel more beats 
which doesn't make you feel, feel as anxious about the space. And I don't always recommend that because sometimes it's good to just feel that long whole note in a ballad, but sometimes you wanna feel the time differently even though it stays in the same spot. So what do I mean by this? Actually, let me, let's use my metronome here for this. <clears throat> Man, my nose is just Niagara Falls in this episode, I apologize. <laughs> So here is my, I'm going to put this on 290. Ooh, whoa, that's, that's too fast. <laughs> I mean, not, not too fast, but for my example, let's do 220. <laughs> Sorry, let's do 220. All right, so this is 220. I'm going to put this on my keyboard here. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, right? So there's our chord note, okay? Now to get used to this, you can start by clapping half notes, right? And just feel half notes. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, three, 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 one, three. One, three, one, three. Now, if I focus on that internally without the metronome going, because I just stopped it, right? All I'd be feeling is this. One, three, one, three, one, three, one, three, right? And that's easy. That feels like a slow swing to me, right? One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. Again, one, three, one, three. Obviously, the time's going by at the same, you know, amount, but I'm feeling it as one, three, one, three. So if I were to feel this in solo, one, three, one, three. So did you hear how I, I'm actually feeling the one and three, right, as like a slow swing? So even though the time could by, be going by one, two, three, right? One, two, three, four, 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 one, two, three. One, two, three. If I feel it, one, three, one, three, go. It's like the chords, you know, it's like I'm feeling it in two. If that makes sense, I don't want to confuse you guys, but here. Again, here's my one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So that's what the bass and drummer are playing, right? It would be playing with a group, but you don't necessarily need to feel it that way, right? So if I put this back on and I comp for myself, right? One, two, one, two, three, four. So you can kind of switch back and forth, but my main, my main point is practice subdividing and feeling the tempo in a subdivision, and that's going to really lessen the anxiety you have of that, 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 right? Even especially at faster tempos too. So if I increase this a little bit, the 240, then you're going to want to subdivide into, into whole notes. So instead of feeling just the half note, just feel one, right? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, 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 one. One, one. Now this is really slow. If I take the metronome off, that annoying pulse of the metronome, we're just feeling this. One, 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 one. It's gonna be like this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. One, 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 one. So if I'm soloing, right? One, two, three, one, one, one. One, 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 one. You know, that's how easy you want to create the feeling. A lot of the times, you know, the, 
anxiety of that that fast tempo is what holds you up right it's about relaxing and breathing and if you can kind of mentally trick yourself to feel the time in a different way it's gonna be a lot easier but obviously you can't swing your lines at a slow tempo like that you know while the tempo is going by fast and that's why you heard me kind of switch back and forth but when you're phrasing the lines and even if I'm phrasing eighth notes you can still feel that pulse right so I'll turn this back on one one one, 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 one. Right? So, you know, when you lessen that anxiety within yourself by subdividing the time, it's really going to see how sparse my solo was, right? You know, stuff like that. It's going to really kind of open up your solo. You don't always have to play all those eighth notes, right? You really want to try and open it up. So, subdivide your time. Let me get back to my notes here. That was number three, okay? Number four. There's two things, two points. My number four and five points are going to sound very similar. I'll just say them together, I guess. Practice connecting what you know, okay? So number five is work out your connections, okay? Now practice connecting what you know is let's say you know modes or you know the C major scale, right? You want to work on practicing and using those connections in your solo. Okay, so st again, this is about staying within your means, but you want to practice connecting what you know. So if you know modes, right, or let's say you know you want to land on chord tones, you want to practice connecting your modes into your chord tones if that's all you know. If you don't know bebop approaches, you know, don't try and play those. Or if you do, then practice connecting your bebop approaches, you know, in your solo. Okay, so. If I just know kind of my C major scale, excuse me, or my modes, right, then I'm going to practice connecting them. And it has to be done at a, a reasonable tempo, right? So take that slower tempo. Practice your connections with what you do know. If you know the blues scale, right? Practice your connections with your blues scale. So if you're if you're kind of practicing at a normal tempo, and what I mean by practicing is put your metronome on, work on a progression, right? And work on the things you know. So if I I'm gonna take an element or a concept, my blues scale, and work on those connections. Now if I play something and it, I fuddle it up. You know, and it, it, it kind of smudges, then I'm going to work on that connection. So if I try and go sup for something, right, or just even that movement, I'm going to take that out, work on it. Sorry. And speed it up slowly so I can isolate that movement and then play it, you know, reasonably next time because it's something within my means. Right? And then that way, after I practice it slowly like that, I can now incorporate it into what I'm doing. And so just work on the things that you know, right? If you know, you know, again, depending upon the progression, if your progression is going D minor to F minor, and you know your mode, your D minor mode going to your F minor mode, work on that connection through the harmonies. Okay, a lot of the big disconnect again is is connecting the harmonies and it doesn't have to be all eighth notes but just know that if I'm if I'm going from D minor to F minor we need to work on that passage with whatever repertoire we have otherwise it's not going to come out and again the purpose of this is to practice slowly with purpose uh, on that connecting harmony you know or 
just work on that slow connection so you get that and then you start to speed it up. Now number five was work out your connections. Okay, so you're probably like, what's the difference between what you just said? Working out your bebop connections. If you're more of an advanced player, you need to get in the habit to create the spontaneity that you want. You need to work through the connections in your progression. So obviously, almost the standard two five one progression is going to be very good for you. All these other progressions one four three six two five one one six two five one. You know. Once you start picking tunes, let's say you're working on a specific tune and you've done all your pre-work over your 251s and other progressions, then you can start to work on those progressions, but they have to be worked out at a slow tempo. So if I'm playing I Should Care, right? So my progression is one, excuse me, two. Right? I'll use some rootless voicings here. <laughs> so it doesn't sound so crappy. Now, that's a quick progression, all right? So we have one, excuse me, two, five, three, six, two, five, one. And each, each chord is happening two beats per measure. So if I'm so, you know, if someone calls I should care, like here, one, two, three, four, one, we have one, two, 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 one, two. Now to solo over that, right? My connections for those harmonies, you can approach it in a horizontal way or a vertical way, right? So you can, you can just play C over that entire thing, and this is where I come back to staying within your means. If all you know is C, and you're not at the level where you can actually really work through your harmonies, then just play C, right? If I take that segment and I just play C, I can create some great lines. One, two, one, two, three, four. I just played C, right? That was all C based. Okay, that's all I know. Like, or that, that you know, that was my approach. If I want to go more working through each chord, then a and this is for more intermediate to advanced players, a slow practice session of that inner working of the harmony needs to take place. You can't just do it on the spot. I, I really can't stress this enough. Guys, listen closely at this point in the podcast. You cannot spontaneously create things that you have not practiced at a slow tempo. And this will happen over time where your hand can actually play for itself without you thinking. But that level where your hand is creating music it, without your mind or anything like that, like on its own, you're, you're improving stuff that you've never played before is, that's Keith Jarrett status, right? That's Brad Meldo. I mean, that, these are, that's very, very high advanced levels. So for your expectation to go into a tune and play it quickly, if you haven't worked out your connections through the harmonies is, it's like it's like thinking you can go play in the NFL or you know go play a, a professional sport. It it just it's not going to happen, right? So what you need to do is work out movements within the harmonies. So here we go. This I would sit here and do this forever until my fingers were kind of comfortable moving around the harmony. So I may go. And again, the reason I'm taking those pauses there is because I'm listening to my ear. I'm listening to my ear on what I hear and kind of where I want to go. Because I could go, I can go wherever I want. And again, if you see some of the notes I'm playing, you're like, well, how does that fit? That is because I've studied more advanced theory concepts. I know more tools I can use. I have more tools in my tool bag to use during improv. I have more options. That's why theory is so important in relation in, you know, so it uh, works as a cohesive unit with technique and repertoire and improv. It's not simply a, a standalone thing.
okay? So again, after I've kind of worked these voicings out, you start to speed up the tempo at that point, and you start at a very slow tempo. So I'm gonna put my metronome on one more time. I'm not gonna get there yet, hold on. One, two, three, four. Right? I just played that line great. Now, if you can do that at 80, bump your tempo up. Let's go to 120. Two, three, four. Now, if you get stuck, right, or at a tempo, right, if I go to 150, if you get stuck at a tempo, whoops, then you need to slow it down again and work on the connections, right, to those harmonies. So here's 150. Right, that came out pretty easily. And again, you just keep working out your connections. And if something doesn't feel comfortable, or let's say, let me try and see if I can find a, uh, a movement that I'm not really sure of, and then I'll work it out for you guys on the spot. Because this happens, it still happens to me. I mean, all right, this is at 240. One, two, one, two, three, four. All right, so I don't really remember exactly what I played, but something in there felt uncomfortable uh, based on the improv line that I did. Right? So if you, if you do a movement or something that doesn't feel right, then you need to go back and slow it down and keep bumping up the tempo for that, right? One, two, one, two, three, four. And again, not all your solos have to be ace notes. Depending upon you want to take, depending upon what your approach is, you want to practice soloing consistently with eighth notes, and you also want to practice leaving that space, okay? Um, and that's another thing, let me see, I'm getting a slightly scattered here on my notes. Uh, last point for this is that practice in all, in both ways. Uh, again, there's gonna be a mental mind wall, plateau, that you need to break past with your fingers, and this comes from working your connections out. But you want to be able to play continuous eighth notes, and you have to do it right in order to break through no matter what like your brain when you make mistakes you, habitually as a person you have it's like a fear response so if you make a mistake on the piano people's habit they built into themselves is to stop right or pull away uh, based on your note or something you hear or even just because you're scared right you're you're fearful of making mistakes and you need to break past that. You can't be fearful. You gotta step through your fear and realize, and this is where the practice comes in, that any note is possible as a useful note in a solo. Any note, right? And I would actually practice from playing chromatic solos so that you understand that you can use any note to move to another note. Uh, just because you play like all the black notes over C, it could be a movement that leads you into, you know, another another concept, right? So you got to break past the fear, and the only way to do that is to practice playing continuous eighth notes, so you get used to that feeling. One, two, three, four. And then you bump it up. So that was 120. I'm going to go to 190. One, two, a one, two, three, four. So I, I yelled because I didn't play my continuous eighth notes because I was setting myself up to resolve it 
rhythmic, rhythmically because I'm used to doing that. But you, again, you just got to break through that. You just got to go. It doesn't matter what notes you play. You got to train yourself to continuously play fast. You know what I mean? It, just don't worry about the notes. You just got to practice playing fast to get used to that feeling too. Here's 260. One, two, one, two, three, four. got to go you just got to go right and, and wherever that level is wherever that plateau is where technically you can't keep going just because your fingers aren't moving that's where your technique has to improve right if you can't just keep playing random notes because technically your fingers can't do it then that's a technique problem and if you have technique if you study classical for a long time you should be able to do that and again, part of that too is going to be breaking past the mental barrier. If you know your hand can do it, but for some reason it's just your mind isn't there yet, you have to practice at a slower tempo until your mind gets used to moving past that fear of playing wrong notes. You just, just play, right? So practice doing that as well. That needs to happen. Uh, that was kind of just a separate practice note on playing fast. That wasn't in my... All right, last two points quickly here. Think like a drummer. Oscar Peterson, uh, fabulous, fabulous pianist, obviously. And to me, his rhythmic abilities have pop to it like I've never heard. Uh, Bill Evans, too. I mean, um, but for my point, playing like a drummer, Oscar's lines are so drummer-like, uh, rhythmically. Um, they're very... Uh, you know, I guess the only way to describe it is for for me to for you guys to listen to it, and obviously me to give you an example here. So, you know, if a drummer would play ba 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 your, the accents and control is going to come through more rather than you kind of worrying about playing legato or playing specific notes. You're really going more for rhythmic, uh, rhythmic contrast and rhythmic variation. And again, so many people's styles, like Bill's style, he has lots of polyrhythms going on, different rhythms, um, and his accents, he worked on this too. His accents are all over the place. He might start or end a line on beat four, um, hold it over, start his line on beat two, so there's a lot of displacement, right, in his rhythms. But again, take a different approach mentally, think like a drummer. So at a faster tempo, if I'm kind of not worried so much about the notes, and my I'm, I'm focusing on rhythms, I don't need to move around a lot. Like I'm just, I can just stay in one spot and really take my approach on as, you know, uh, a drummer, okay? So I'm gonna put this on two, 220 here. And uh, I'll stick with my two five ones here. One, two, one, two, three, four. Right, if you, I, I really kind of think of uh, Philly Joe here, like uh, you know, on a snare. Right, all these rhythms when you hear, or even some brushwork, right, that Ed Thigpen would do with Oscar. You know, those rhythms is different rhythmic patterns, not just eighth notes. Right, just playing constant eighth notes is going to get boring. You want triplets in there, sixteenth notes, right? And those movements in the in the accents, right? Instead of going, how you hit those notes is really gonna make a big difference, right? Or if you really target a note, 
Um, let me see. Right? So you're really hitting it. Right? If you were to hear that on a drum, it'd sound like. Right? So think rhythmically. Try and really approach your souls rhythmically. And when you have that mental mindset, it's easier to stay in the pocket, actually. The really the main outcome you're gonna get with that is you're gonna be able to stay in the pocket much better because you're thinking like a drummer. You're not worrying about notes. You're really kind of going after the rhythms and playing off what the bass and the drummer are doing. Now, the last one is a very easy one. And the reason I saved this for last is to, um, is because I really felt that it was, it was the least important. And actually, most people go to this first. You know, how do I play faster? Um, improve your language, right? When we're learning a language, English, French, Spanish, whatever language you're learning, in order to speak faster and more fluently, you know, you need to be able to put your sentence structures together and, and obviously just, you know, learn, learn the sentences. So to me, kind of in a language, if you improve your language, it's like improving your, improving your jazz language. So by learning certain movements or techniques, such as learning these through transcriptions and copying licks, right? This is going to improve your language. So if you were to see me do a movement, right? That little maybe word or phrase, you know, you can take that from me or whoever you listen to play it and improve your language. So once you practice that, right? You can use that in all keys. You can use it however you want it. You know, you you can displace it over. It doesn't have to be the second going up to the third, right? It can be wherever. You can go to the fifth, right? Whatever key you're in, you can do it however you want. But just by learning that little segment, you're improving your language, right? You have more language to go to when soloing. So it actually, obviously, allows you to have more freedom in movement because you have that in your arsenal now. And again, that comes through licks and transcriptions, okay? So uh, learning licks or playing transcriptions, that's how you're gonna improve your language. But again, to me, in my opinion, that's the last step. All the steps I've listed before first are much more important and you should prioritize them because that's what builds your foundation. You need the theory tools, you need the te technical tools, the dexterity, the movements, the slow work, even before you need to do that. Because I can create a solo without that, playing very, very simple at fast tempos, and that's the level you should get to, then start to improve your language, right? Then start to um, pick some of those pieces out. And a lot of people go to picking the pieces out first, and that's all you can do, right? So in a solo, you know, uh, let me see. You know, they're just playing licks. It's like a re, I was trying to play some sort of lick that came to me. Nothing came to me, <laughs> obviously. But uh, I'm trying to think of a lick, right? Well, just even this lick. I mean, that's, that's so naturally integrated into my playing that it doesn't, it doesn't sound like a lick to me. I'm trying to think of a cliche lick. Um, uh, you know, something like that. When you get to a point, that's all you're gonna play, right? So you might be like. You know, and the only thing naturally that comes out is that lick you've practiced that doesn't fit with anything else that you're playing and it just doesn't, it, it doesn't it's, you're, not, you're still not freely expressing yourself, right? You have to be honest with yourself. By playing licks that you don't understand or fit naturally to you, that feel natural, they don't feel natural, you're waiting for a spot to incorporate a lick. Now I'm not saying that's necessarily bad. You wanna to get to that point and still use that kind of stuff, but if that's all you're focusing on, doing it first, you're never going to be able to achieve the complete freedom and effortlessness that you hear in recordings and albums and from players, okay? Because all the things I mentioned first have to be done first and built upon. That's why the Jazz Piano School system and my education uses four categories to lead you to that direction. Otherwise, you know, when I was so frustrated, that's all I was doing. All right, I feel myself going on a little tangent here, so I'm just gonna stop before I get going. But hopefully these 
points help you guys. It's a very interesting uh, subject actually because I have a lot of weaknesses to work on tempo-wise too because everyone has barriers. You know, at a certain tempo, I can feel myself losing control or losing my natural flow or effortlessness at certain points, even over certain harmonies. And that's stuff that I still need to work out now that, that I go through the same process. I use the same exact process I just described to you guys. You slow the tempo down, work on your connections, work it out, right? Work your fingering out, your movements, get comfortable, then you start to increase your tempo. So I hope this helps. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, I always try and keep these under an hour because they, they, they can go pretty long. But again, uh, hopefully these, these little exercises help. Keep working on it. It's a grind. I know. It's just re realize it's, never a, it's not a fast process, right? It takes time. Be patient. And the more you discipline yourself, listen closely. This is very important. Something, the last thing I'll leave with you with, if anything, that you can take away from this episode. The more you discipline yourself to work through things slowly at a tempo you can manage that's honest and truthful to your abilities, right? The more progress you're gonna make in a much, much shorter amount of time. Trust me, I've seen it. I've done it. I've seen it by students. But the funny thing is, so many people, the hardest thing that they have to do is the actual act of disciplining themselves. It's not playing piano. It's not learning jazz. It's the act of disciplining yourself to incorporate your muscle memory and get that going slowly before your hand learns mistakes. Because when you take something at a fast tempo first, and you play those mistakes, that's like teaching your hand mistakes. You're actually teaching your muscle memory mistakes and bad habits. And then it takes three times as long to undo those mistakes that you've taught your hand and put the correct ones in there. All right, so thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you being here and taking the time to listen to me, and happy practicing.